Hello everyone, welcome to this episode of PKB Inspire. Have you wondered why the products you bought on Amazon are not going to arrive on time for the Christmas? In fact, some of the products have been shifted to delivery dates around May 2022. The reason transcends just the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a fundamental issue with supply chain disruptions across the globe and a very little spoken about phenomenon called the bullwhip effect that is contributing to this disruption as much as the pandemic. Stay tuned. The supply chain is an integral part of any form of delivery system. In fact, for you to get any product delivered to you, the supply chain for that specific product would have to be smooth, well coordinated, and the collaboration between the organizations that would have to work together to deliver the end product to you would have to be almost impeccable. Society as a whole have become very used to what we call the just-in-time delivery system. If you want a product, you walk into a store or go to a virtual storefront, you would have the product available. It's such that companies do not hold inventory that do not go beyond the projected forecast demand that they have in their systems. So for whatever product or demand that comes in, we deliver and produce those products according to the kind of demand that is coming in. This JIT system, or what we call the just-in-time system, could not handle the various disruptions during the pandemic. You have instances where the shipping containers, whether normal containers or reefer containers, were simply not available. The supply chain disruptions due to the COVID-19 really hit the well-acclaimed just-in-time systems. Have you ever thought about how do the products get there such that each week or each month when you enter a store, the product is always available? Behind the scenes is what we call supply chain management. You see, supply chain management simply means that these are the activities that are interconnected to ensure that the demand for a specific product is available at the right time, in the right condition, at the right price, in the right quality to the final consumer. All these checklists would have to be met for the supply chain to be successful. However, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are beginning to experience a lot of shortages in the stores. In fact, Amazon is reporting that for most of the orders that have come through for the Christmas period, those orders would have to be pushed back to next year. These disruptions means that our notion of the JIT system of product delivery is completely disrupted. We need to rethink how we deliver goods and services to consumers. Now, companies like Costco, Walmart, and Home Depot taking matters into their own hands. The retail giants renting out their own shipping containers and looking for different ports of entry. Companies are considering vertical integrations. What do I mean by vertical integrations? Simply put, if the function of logistics or the function of warehousing is previously outsourced to an external third-party service provider, because of the current supply chain constraint that we have, companies are bringing those functions in-house so they can have better control. If you think about it, that as companies are grappling to survive these supply chain disruptions, the ports that receive these vessels are also getting congested. The Southern California ports responsible for nearly half of all U.S. imports hitting record highs for the number of container ships waiting to unload. Let me walk you through a simple overview of a supply chain. You have typically what we call the focal firm. The focal firm in this case is the actual supply chain captain. This is the company that owns either the intellectual property rights or has the product to its name. An example I can give would be the PlayStation 5. So in this case, Sony is the supply chain captain and is the focal firm in this case. How does Sony interact with other organizations or companies 
to ensure that the PlayStation 5 comes to the market on time and is de delivered to each and every customer who places an order with the expected delivery dates. We have what we call suppliers. So the suppliers are basically the external organizations who give the raw material input to the focal firm. We are looking at the transistors, we are looking at um, the, the microchips that are needed and the various other components that are needed to put together the PlayStation 5. So Sony would definitely depend on external companies like Foxconn who would you know, provide some form of manufacturing and raw material inputs towards the manufacturing of the Sony PlayStation 5. Apart from the suppliers, we also have what we call the, um, the logistics component of the supply chain. So we mean the movement aspect of the supply chain. And wherever a product is manufactured, that, that product cannot be consumed where it is manufactured. Think about it. If Sony produces the PlayStation 5, it cannot leave the PlayStation 5 where it is manufactured. It has to be transported to the final consumer. First of all, when raw materials come from the suppliers, it would have to be stored. Again, the manufacturing process is such that when raw materials come in, the rate of production is not necessarily in tandem with the rate of delivery of raw materials. So at some point in time, when the focal firm is buying raw materials, it is thinking about cost. It's thinking about how much can I buy in bulk to enjoy from economies of scale such that the unit cost of my raw material input is low enough to ensure the viability of production. So obviously the focal firm would buy the raw materials in bulk and would have to store those raw materials such that they are able to gradually deplete those raw materials as a factor of production. So in this case, we need warehousing between the supplier and the focal firm. And when the focal firm produces the, the, the product, in this case, the PlayStation 5, within the production entity, there's something we call WIP. So that is the working process. What happens is that the putting together of PlayStation 5 does not happen instantaneously. So there are sh people who run shifts within the manufacturing entity. So there will be some parts that would have to be left in a certain form for another aspect of production to take over. Again, those aspects would have to be stored. Now between the time when the finished product is ready and when the customer gets his or her PlayStation 5, a lot of things happen. One of the key issues would be distribution centers. You see, in order to reduce the distance traveled between the point of production to the point of consumption, there has to be some intermediary storage points that makes it reasonably easier for Sony to deliver the final product. So companies typically would have what we call DCs or distribution centers across the globe. This helps to ship the product in huge quantities to these distribution centers. Of course, this is based on the forecast and based on demand patterns. So let's say Sony ships 10,000 units of PlayStation 5 to a distribution center in UK to serve the UK market or a distribution center in Germany to serve the European market. The implications of this is that Sony therefore is able to ensure that the time traveled between a customer in Germany and the distribution center, of course, is shorter than, for example, the distance between Germany and Foxconn that is based in China. The logistics aspect, which I mentioned earlier, also comes into play. That is the movement aspect of your supply chain. Anytime anything moves from one point to another, you can term it as logistics. Describing further the logistics function within the supply chain. So now the question comes into play with the uh, manufacturer. How do we handle this logistics issue? Do we buy trucks and move the products from the manufacturing plants to the distribution centers and then from the distribution centers to the final consumer? Or do we find what we call 3PLs? So these are third-party logistics providers. 
the three PLs basically shoulder this aspect of the supply chain, which is the logistics function. They shoulder all the complexities. Usually they have lots of track, they have the capacity, and they enjoy from economies of scale, and they make basically the logistics cost a bit more reasonable for the focal firm. So let's say that in this scenario, we have a 3PL, a third party logistics provider, who takes on the responsibility of moving the product from point A to point B. However, during COVID, almost everything has changed. Let me explain. Let us start from the suppliers. COVID has presented some layers of complexity, disruption, and a certain degree of unpredictability in all supply chains across the globe. Suppliers are struggling to keep up with the unplanned demand. But experts tell us in the coming days, it's going to be consumers who bear the brunt with fewer goods and higher prices. You see, in every supply chain, there is what we call the bullwhip effect. It's the kind of assumptions in demand or the kind of increase in demand from the downstream of your supply chain from the market. An example is that when COVID first hit, you did realize that there was shortages of toilet rolls or tissues on the market. The issue was not really about production. It wasn't because of the fact that products were not being manufactured or toilet rolls were not being manufactured. It's also because of the kind of attitudinal response from the average consumer. And this kind of created a dilemma, which we know in supply chain management as the bullwhip effect. Now, what this really is, let's start from me as an example. Let's say during the pandemic, I assume that because of the announcement of the lockdown, there's going to be closure of supermarkets. So I go to the supermarket and instead of buying a pack of toilet roll, I buy five packs. My neighbor also buys six packs instead of the, the usual one pack of toilet roll they buy. Now, remember that as you're making these purchases, the store is also having this data. So they are seeing that normally around December, November, December, they don't get this kind of demand. And then it's like all of a sudden, there is a huge demand for toilet roll. They, when they are planning their next consignment, they are going to factor in this kind of behavior from the consumer. And then they said, okay, look, we actually need four cartons of toilet roll. But because of the pandemic, let's add an additional four cartons just to be safe. We are going to request for eight cartons from the manufacturer. Now, when this demand hits the manufacturer, again, they are also shaking. What is happening? Normally, we get four cartons of demand from this store. Now we are getting eight. Because of this, let's also produce an additional four just to be safe for the next cycle of demand that is coming through so that in case that also goes up, we, are, we have a buffer. The manufacturer needs raw materials to produce these 12 cartons. And then they tell their suppliers that, look, we need raw materials for 12 cartons. But you see, in reality, the actual demand that came to the focal firm was eight cartons. However, they are requesting for raw materials that can produce 12 cartons of demand. And this is the bullwhip effect. So when the demand is coming upstream, the supply chain towards the focal firm, there is this exponential increase due to this behavior of, you know, trying to curtail unforeseen risk. And this puts a lot of pressure on the supply chain. So now, the supplier is grappling with where do I get raw materials to give to this client who needs to produce 12 cartons. Remember that this supplier we are referring to is also supplying to other clients. So if we take Foscon, Foscon is manufacturing for Samsung, for Apple, for PlayStation. All these focal firms are depending on Foscon. And if all the demand that is coming to Foscon is being based on this bullwhip effect, then obviously Foscon will say, look, I don't have enough manpower to manufacture. There's too much demand. Why is your demand over the roof this time? And then there is an issue. Raw materials 
will definitely not be available manufacturing capabilities will definitely not be available and then when we move away from the focal firm to the logistics providers the three pls so these are the likes of Greece Harbor, yeah, DSV is an example of a 3PL. Now, these companies are also having to grapple with some constraints during the pandemic. What are these constraints? In Europe, there's a typical situation where there aren't enough truck drivers to basically drive these trucks. If you got it, a truck brought it. If you got your food, your clothing, your medicine, if you got fuel for your homes, fuel for your industries, a truck brought it to you. So imagine this, the focal firm has produced the 12 cartons, but who is going to transport this production output to the distribution centers? The 3PLs, they have trucks, yeah? But there are no drivers to drive these trucks. The UK, for example, has put into place, or they've passed a bill actually, to hire temporary truck drivers or to give temporary residence permits in the form of an emergency approval system for these truck drivers to gain residency in the UK in order to work. The next form of transportation is the sea freight. So basically using ships to transport the final product from point A to point B. Mind you that getting to the Christmas period, the bull whip effect always comes into play but this time on top of that layer is COVID-19 where there's so much uncertainty and so much risk. Now going back to the DSV scenario, so now DSV picks the 12 cartons and ships it to the distribution center. The distribution center also is receiving products from other manufacturing plants and sometimes in certain rare cases you have external storage facilities that serves as distribution centers. And so you are sharing the space with also some other companies. 12 cartons get to the distribution center and the demand is coming through. The actual demand, as we mentioned earlier, from the market was four cartons. So you have 12 cartons sitting in the distribution center, four cartons depleted due to the real demand on the market. And then you have eight cartons occupying space in the distribution center or the warehouse and there's no demand for it. Product obsolescence will come into play. There's a lot of cost that is associated with storage. So we have some form of artificial demand that is eclipsing the real demand of all products across all categories. And then on top of that, the lack of raw materials, manufacturing constraints, lack of truck drivers, sea freight vessels getting to the port and they cannot offload containers due to the low capacity at the ports. So this is why the probability that the product you ordered for Christmas is going to be delayed is actually more than 60%. So if you are thinking of ordering something for Christmas at this very juncture, don't. I hope that this episode of PKB Inspire has been educative and informative. Thank you. See you in the next one.